The Many Lives of Christian Dior. Episode 3, A Family Torn Apart. The euphoria of the 20s was finished, and the 30s were anything but roaring. But Christian Dior had already sensed that as soon as he saw the broken mirror. It was in the dining room of his family house at Les Roms in Granville, at the end of the summer of 1930. His superstition proved to be right. Only a few months later, in May 1931, his mother Madeleine died. She was only 51. My mother, whom I adored, suddenly faded away and died of grief. These lines taken from his autobiography, Dior by Dior, published in 1956, hinted at a secret. A secret that had shrouded his seemingly perfect family for years. When he wrote that his mother died of grief, he was inevitably referring to Bernard, his youngest brother, the fourth of the siblings, five years his junior. While Bernard had always been unruly, As he got older, the family began to understand that something was eating away at him inside. A psychiatric disorder for which the era had few answers. Each of Bernard's crises left his parents and family further distraught. After his mother's death, Bernard would be diagnosed with schizophrenia and committed in Pontorson, Normandy. For the rest of his existence, Christian would be greatly influenced by memories of his mother, He unquestionably thought of her at every stage in his life. It was of her that he was thinking when he designed his first collection, The New Look, a collection in which he reinvented the Belle Époque silhouette, with its narrow waist, its curves, the famous S-shaped form. But let us return to 1931, when the family's fate was on the brink. Looking back on it now, I see that it was fortunate that her death came when it did, although it marked me for life. My mother left us before she knew of the perilous future unfolding before us. Maurice Dior, his father, who had made large investments in real estate, would lose it all with the advent of the economic crash of 1929, which swept across Europe. In 1931, Maurice Dior was forced to liquidate all his assets. It marked a stunning reversal of fortune for him and his family. The skies over Christian darkened, and the place in which he sought a sliver of light was, oddly enough, the USSR. He joined an architectural study trip. This voyage was important for him and exactly what he needed at that time. He wanted to go far away, to get away from friends, from his family and his worries, to get a taste of a better future the future he imagined as a young man when he dreamed of being an architect. By undertaking this trip, he could get his passion for architecture back. When it came to Russian architecture, it was the splendor of the palaces of the Russian Tsars to which he was drawn, rather than the modernist construction of the USSR. Christian Dior was a sworn romantic. But the trip would ultimately fail in allowing him to forget his worries, friends, and his family. Jacques Bonjean, his partner, declared the bankruptcy of what had, nevertheless, been an amazing adventure. But Christian Dior didn't flinch. His reaction was surprisingly calm. He kept a cool head and a clear mind, unlike his older brother, Raymond. Faced with successive dramas, Christian, who had been the whimsical dreamer, shy and somewhat unassuming, the eternal teenager, now became a man as his big brother Raymond crumbled. His journey so far had already been particularly difficult. On the eve of his 18th birthday, Raymond had left to fight in the First World War. There, he saw his entire platoon wiped out by a shell during the Battle of the Somme. He came back alive, but would remain traumatized to the end of his days. Talk of war was forbidden, and he became a pacifist, almost anarchically so, something his father viewed with a negative eye. This sparked a long-lasting discord between father and son, even if it didn't prevent them from working together in the family business. Naturally, when Maurice lost everything, Raymond lost everything too, 
describing himself as the lost child of the bourgeoisie. From that point on, he expected nothing good from life. The world seemed indifferent to him. Christian, on the other end, persevered. He stayed in Paris even when he no longer had a permanent roof over his head there. The apartment in Passy had been seized by the bank and the Dior clan took refuge for a time in the family home at Granville. Christian could still count on friends to take him in. Pierre Coll welcomed him to his gallery. He was also an art dealer and allowed Christian Dior to sell his paintings. Unfortunately, given the context, any confidence in the art market had gone. The buyers had pretty much all disappeared, and Christian Dior had to sell off all his treasures. Nightlife appeared well and truly over. No more parties at Le Boeuf sur le Toit, the famous entouar establishment where Louis Moises received the artistic elite and the great and the good of Bohemian Paris. Moises, who had become a friend of Christian Dior, put him up for a while above Le Boeuf sur le Toit, just under the roof. A garret, far removed from the luxury to which he had always been accustomed. But despite this, Christian seemed to be doing his best to enjoy life. Everything went. The roof, the water, the electricity, and later on money. The house, which had in more glorious days given shelter to Benjamin Franklin, was doomed to the picks of the demolition man. But nothing stops youth from laughing and having a good time. Those who were less badly off and had some small means hastened to rally us. For a night, with the help of a few bottles, a piano, and a gramophone, we would keep away the mice as we invented fantastic amusements. One day, Pierre Coll's gallery also shut its doors. Now Christian Dior really had to work. But instead, he fell ill. He was suffering from tuberculosis, a fatal disease in the 1930s. But he would fight it, once again supported by the generosity of his friends. Thanks to them, he was able to leave for a cure in a sanatorium. He headed off to the heights of the Pyrenees, a wondrous mountain escape. Perpignan, the Route Nationale 116, leads up into the snow-covered Sardinia after having passed through picturesque Catalan villages whose names can only be pronounced with a Sardinia rhythm. At 1,800 meters lies the renowned Pyrenees resort of Font-Romeu, whose tourist amenities explain these images. The climatological merits of the Sardinia region, the sunniest in France, have allowed for the creation of many establishments welcoming children with bronchitis or asthma. The sun and the open air had a restorative effect. Rest, reading, and drawing were his only routine. And he drew. A lot. After an existence that had been unstable for several years, he had come here to gather his strength and heal. And when the cure had ended, he set course for the Balearic Islands, Mallorca, and once again the sun. Everything awed and amazed him there, starting with the local craftsmanship, which he found fascinating. And then he began to make things, to create. It was during this retreat from Paris, where I had always been content to admire the artistic achievement of others, that I discovered in myself the desire to create something of my own. I learned the art of tapestry making and became tremendously enthusiastic about it. I have said earlier that it was my ambition to be classed as a good craftsman. As the spring weather warmed Mallorca, Christian Dior felt better. And he was better. He headed back to Paris, returning with the sun and imbued with new color that put an end to the dark years. By now, he was 30 years old. He had grown up and it was time for him to take charge of his destiny. He knew that someday, luck would smile on him. But in the meantime, he must first find a job. For example, he applied for a position with the great couturier Lucien Lelon. But the future creator of the new look was not fated to revolutionize haute couture at Lelon at this time. He had applied for an administrative job but was ultimately not kept on. But what he did not yet know was that a little later, 
he was going to return to the same house in a more creative role, as a designer in Lucien Lelon's studio. But for now, Christian Dior doesn't know that his future lay in fashion. And yet, he had always sketched and continued to do so. Not simply to forget the difficulties of everyday life, but also in order to improve, something in which he was encouraged by a couple of friends with whom he was living at the time. But for now, Christian Dior doesn't know that his future lay in fashion. And yet, he keeps sketching and sketching, not simply to forget the difficulties of everyday life, but also in order to improve, something at which he was encouraged by a couple of friends with whom he was living at the time. Their names were Max Kenna and Jean Ozen. Ozen was the cousin of another friend, the painter Christian Bérard, and Kenna taught him about proportion, instructing him in techniques and encouraging his creativity. This is how Christian Dior refined what would become his masterful pencil stroke. <laughs> 